Welcome to another edition of Senior Moments with a Question Mark. And the reason we have a question mark is because we do not have senior moments. We have intellectual pauses. <laughs> All right. So anyway, we have a repeat visitor um, from a couple years ago, former mayor Bill Scanlon, who has just written a book. Bill, what's the name of the book? Bringing Beverly Back from the Brink. And that's exactly what you did. All right, before we get into that, a couple jokes. Bill, um, what did the baby light bulb say to the mummy light bulb? I don't know. Mommy, I love you what and what. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, anyway. Since I have a politician on today, we're going to have to get into politics right away. Bill, definition of a Democrat. You have two cows. Your neighbor has none. You feel guilty for being successful. You vote people into office who put a tax on your cow, forcing you to sell one to raise money to pay the tax. The people you voted for then take the tax money, buy a cow, and give it to your neighbor. You feel righteous. And Barbara Streisand sings for you. <laughs> okay, socialist. You have two cows. The government takes one and gives it to your neighbor. You form a cooperative to tell him how to manage his cow. Republican, you have two cows. Your neighbor has none. So? <laughs> All right, enough of that. Okay, so, once upon a time, you were born in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Well, I grew up to the extent I ever grew up in Dorchester and uh, walked to school, customary kindergarten through grade six. And at that point, I was told by my parents that I'd be going to the Boston Latin School starting in grade seven. And after that, for the next six years, I took a bus, a train, and a streetcar to get to school, and the reverse in the afternoon to get home. A nickel each way. What about the summers? The summers, there was a polio scare in Boston at that right. time. And in the year of my birth, actually, my father built a cottage in Marshfield, about 30 miles south of Boston, right. to get away from the problems. And uh, yeah, with his own two hands, he built that. And for the first dozen years of my life, summers were spent in Marshfield. Okay. So off to uh, Latin you went, and then after Latin? After Latin school, I went to uh, MIT for four years. I thought you went in the service first. No, no. Oh, no, no, no that, that was Harvard Business School. No, I, I, I had a, it was the, the universal draft back in those days, and I had a, a deferral during my time in college. But very shortly after getting out of college, um, they were coming. They were coming. Yeah, they were coming. And so I chose to go into the service through Officer Candidate School. What did you uh, major in at MIT? 
Ultimately, I got my degree in civil engineering, but I tried a few other things on the way. <laughs> Including uh, mechanical engineering, which uh, my father was. Yes, uh, and, and it's truly a tough subject. And at the time, I, re I wasn't ready and willing to work as hard as it would have required. Yeah, so, he ended up being a professional uh, engineer. He also worked at the shoe for a while and, and, and designed a number of patents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I studied geology too, but in the end I wound up with my degree in civil engineering. Turned out to be pretty damn useful years later because Beverly had a whole lot of flooding problems. Right. Um, but you, uh, you, you also, um, after the service, you went to Harvard, I went, Harvard Business School. Yes. But in the summers, you worked for who? Well, I worked at the, the, the graduate degree in business is a two-year program, so there's really only one summer in between there, and I worked for United Shoe Machinery that summer. Ah, that's where it started. That's where it started. And you got to know all the big wigs and whatever, and... The, you behaved yourself, you performed real well, and they invited you to go to Montreal. Well, first they... No, no, J New Jersey first. Yeah, yeah. They, they told me to go to New Jersey and see if I could help out, and I was afraid they might transfer me to New Jersey, so I commuted, leaving that, this that, area. That must have been brutal. It was. For 18 months, 4 a.m., Monday mornings, I'd go to New Jersey, and then at 5 o'clock Friday afternoons, I'd come home. Wow. All right, how long did that go on for? 18 months. Whew. I guess I could survive 18 months of that if that's all it was. Okay, and then north you go? Then I got the opportunity to go to Montreal, yes, where there was kind of a miniature United Shoe Machinery Company. And... Uh, it wasn't doing very well, but there was no reason it couldn't do well. Well, they weren't doing very well in New Jersey either. Oh, New Jersey was a bad acquisition. It, it, you know, it was, they bought a low margin business in a high cost area, and they had no, nothing really going their way. But Montreal was very different. But they had factories all over the world. United Shoe Machinery had yeah. factories all over the world. It did. But this factory in, in New Jersey made self-tapping screws only. Mm. And it was just a tough, tough business. We had to work extremely hard just to get it to break even. All right, so they kicked you out of Montreal and, and, and sent you to Beverly. Well, I spent five good years in Montreal. And I, we, I'm, and, I'm joking with you. <laughs> okay. So down to Beverly you come to straighten things up because the company was losing money because of the, um, what, what did the government do? Well, among other things, the government found United Shoe Machinery to be a monopoly and That's forced right. it to divest of a significant amount of its shoe machinery business. At the same time, there was starting to get uh, competition in, in, in the business with other, other uh, companies. Four or five things happened. One was a trend toward casual shoes. Okay. There's not much money making a sneaker. Right. Uh, a second was that after World War II, the Asians and the Italians in particular became formidable competitors. Okay. The patents, which had been a strong point for United Shoe Machinery for many years, all began to expire. And the industry reached what you call maturity, where it was pretty much as, as well done at that point as it could get, with few exceptions. So a plant that was thriving and had 5,000 employees at one time uh, started to dwindle. It did. 
And it, it did, and they tried to bring in what they called outside contract work. And while they were able to get this work, they couldn't get it with the same kind of gross margins they were used to getting off of the shoe machinery. Now, a lot of people think that the shoe made shoes. Yes. They did not. No, they, they were very careful. They might make a left shoe or a right shoe, but they didn't want their customers to think they were in competition for, with them. So they made the machines to make and the leased shoe. them out. Okay. And they made famous the, the so-called unit charge. They would lease or rent the machine very inexpensively. But then every time the machine put on a heel or attached a sole, it would be another penny or two cents. Mm. And that allowed a lot of people throughout New England and across the country to get into shoemaking in the 20s and 30s oh, and yeah, 40s, yeah, uh, even though they had no money. People had machines in their houses. It wasn't just in uh, small factories. Yes, there were the do it at home. And there were other companies did that too. The people over at Hotwatt, for example, in, in, over in Danvers, had a lot of homework done and then brought to the factory. Okay, so then uh, the company got sold, it got sold again, and before you know it, you come in one day and they say, it's over, Bill. Well, you know, <laughs> let me adjust that a little bit. Um, I, I got the chance to, to rise within the company, and I was in charge of the shoe machinery business from 82 to 86. And in 86, we had a really terrific year. On revenues of $150 million, we had pre-tax operating profit, profit of $20 million and a return on the money tied up in the business of 29%. It was, why that they, was wunderbar. Why did they want to sell? I don't know. I don't know. But they got what was probably a pretty good price. However, the people who bought it got all their money from venture capitalists or that are called vulture capitalists, <laughs> and very quickly, they wanted their money back. This and, is true. That's, and, how, that's how the business And we had, been, we had been very thorough at streamlining the companies. A lot of people yeah. had retired, laid off, et cetera. And so then they started to try to squeeze it further, but they weren't cutting fat at that point. They were cut, cutting bone and muscle. And the, in five years... They drove the company completely out of business worldwide. Pretty awful. Okay. So you're out in the street. And this was what year? Uh, the end of 86. The end of 86. What do I have in my notes? Yeah. 86. The end. The end. <laughs> All right. So you decided to build your own house. I mean, you were a civil engineer. You knew construction. So you and your wife, Louise, went about building your, your, your new home up in Centerville. Yes. How did that go? Well, it went quite well. We still live there. You like blasting all that granite out of there? Well, the reason that piece of land was available was <laughs> the granite. <laughs> yeah, it, it was uh, it was significant to to blast our way through the granite, but yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, we enjoyed building that house, and we still enjoy that house. Okay, so Beverly was in bad, bad shape, getting ready to go into receivership and all that. And Monaghan had slid by for years, five times reelected. Five times elected, yeah. Uh, and um, so Louise started planning some things in your head. Yeah, she was the first one to suggest I run for mayor. Yeah, that was in 92. And eventually, she won out. 
Well, and Beverly's been the better of it because of Louise. We should, we should build a statue. Louise should have her own statue. <laughs> Our clock next to yours. Well, it's not my clock. It's our clock. All right. People have trouble with that, but it's our clock. Uh, Louise was the first one with that idea, but Salvi Madagno was a very key influence. He, he was one savvy cat. Also, uh, during that time, uh, you, you did a lot of consulting. Yes, that's how I made my living. Right, right. And, of course, you had tremendous... Uh, business background and civil engineering and and so that was a natural plus you could do it on your own time you could uh, you were your own boss and that that of course i'm sure appealed to you um okay so when you come in what 93 uh uh, the election, for my first election was in November of 93. Right. And you only inherited an $8 million deficit. Yes. Nice. Okay, so you thought about it, you met with your people, and what strategies did you come up with? Well, I had... How are you going to get Beverly out of that so we don't go into receivership? People were leaving. They were, there were signs for sale all over the city. The most fundamental problem that affected Beverly at the time, the city council and the school committee couldn't get along at all. And the people who were being transferred from elsewhere into this region looked at the Beverly school system and said, well, I don't want my kids there. Plus, so the plus, infrastructure of the schools was in dire arrears. It had been ignored for years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so more and more houses went on the market, and the prices were low, and it was really a, a fundamental mess. So we had to do a lot of things. One was run the government of the city much more effectively than we had. The patronage system you got rid of? As the extent we could, yes. Yeah, the extent, yeah. extent you could. That's, that, takes a, that takes a while. But see, because you were in office so long, eventually you were able to get a good hold on that. I think that helped, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me see what I got in my notes here. <gasps> Beverly Golf and Tennis. Mm -hmm. A wonderful subject. That, that almost caused you to drink. Um, okay. I'll let you. I'll let you tell the story on on on, on that because, it's, that in my opinion, and some others that I've talked to, it was one of the main reasons you lost uh, the election uh, uh, to Crean. Well, uh, because there was so uh, much stuff going on. Well, first, when I was first elected, in the week between Christmas and New Year's. Mayor Monahan and the Golf and Tennis Commission signed a five-year contract with the current operator, which totally tied my hands for five years. And the city and, was and the city wasn't getting any money uh, at all. They were just a pittance, pittance. Just a pittance. Yeah. Right. So five years later, or four and a half years later, it was time to put the thing back out. Now, this time, the, the state demanded that we use a different approach, that we put it on a basis where people's money and their management would both be considered in making the award. 
So it wasn't guaranteed that the party willing to pay the most money would get the award. Right. So I asked the commission to look over the various bids that came in. And by the way, a number of bids came in, and they were all for serious money, including one from Arnold Palmer. The commission came back to me and said, give the award to the existing operator who will now pay you handsomely. He'd had a deal, but the deal's over. I said, all right. It was an eight or nine member commission. That was their conclusion. We then got sued for doing that. By Johnson. By Johnson, who was the, an, an alternative bidder. Yes, another bidder. And the, the suggestion we got from the city's legal department was uh, put it out to arbitration. So we did. And the arbiter came back and, back and said, give it to Johnson. Okay. So, and Johnson wasn't the easiest guy to get along with. No. So, you still had problems. Yeah, well, we had a problem, and the abbot, a tra a trader, uh, or the abbot, had said he has to get it. Uh, and that was a source of a fair amount of contention. I'm sure that the mess with the golf course didn't help me in the election. How did I you get rid of Korea. Johnson? Well, his, his time ran out eventually. His contract time ran out. All right. Then who took over? Well, it went to yet another party. I can't think, think of the name right now. Is that when it went to Manny Burroughs? I honestly don't remember, don't remember as I sit here. All right. But I can tell you that from that point on, after the first year with Johnson, the city took took in serious money going right. forward. My recollection is about a half million dollars a year. All right, so it was up to Manny to pay pay the city some money, and he reneged. And a lawsuit went on for close to 10 years yes. with, with, with Manny. And Cahill finally... Uh, uh, solved it, uh, brought it to a conclusion with a reduced amount. But you you were gone by I that. was gone. Well, you were this gone. is the ninth year of my being gone. Yeah, so anyway. The golf course is doing better now, but um, the city has okayed a very large amount of money for a study to be done to replace the pump, to, to turn around and redo the clubhouse, et cetera, et cetera, and it's going to cost a ton of money. And you're not seeing anything in the paper about it, which is not surprising. I, I don't want to get onto the newspaper. Um, okay, so lots of things uh, were, 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 were done. Beverly Common was redone. Indeed it was, yes. Rezoning, adding 20 feet down on um, Rantoul. On a portion of Rantoul Street, Although yes. a lot of people are very unhappy about that. And then... Um, land, uh, land, land was bought where Stop and Chop is, and that helped. That was in 94. You took care of flooding in a number of areas. Cherry Hill was developed. All right, tell us the story of the missing check. Uh, Woody Martin. Woody, by the way, is a phenomenal tennis player, and he was my doubles partner uh, when we played tournaments. And he could play tennis both with both hands equally as well. He was amazing. Well, when, the, when Sam Fonzo Drive was built, land that was owned by Excellus was given frontage and made that land more valuable. Right. So among the participants in putting together the money to build Sam Fonzo Drive, one was Excellus. And one of their checks 
uh, somehow got lost and yeah, didn't Woody, get cashed. Woody actually hand delivered it down to you, and then, like magic, it disappeared. And then Crane claimed he found it, because I mean, couldn't find it because that was one of his employees doing some sort of a check. And so what? A new, well, well a it's new the simplest sto a a story as, as the check got lost and they issued a new check. So that was that. End of story. There was no story. Yeah. Well, Crane tried to make it into a big story, and the paper went along with him. I can, I can vividly re, uh, re, re, rem remember that. Um, okay. So some of the key people you brought on that really helped you were John Dunn. A good man, yes, the finance guy. Yeah. Right. And uh, Mike Collins. Mike Collins, yes, yes. First my, Mike, uh, Papa Michael and then Mike Collins, yeah. And of course, uh, Tom Alexander is the one that introduced you to Cummings and the rest is history on the Cummings Center. Yeah, uh, the role I played there was making sure that it was somebody who had the the wherewithal and the vision to really do something. Oh, Cummings yeah. had that. Others had come before him, and yeah. the price to buy the property at the time was so low that a lot of people could come up with yeah, that but money, it was, but it they was couldn't a development. have handled it. It was the development of it, and right. Cummings had, uh, uh, you know, he was a visionary. He's... He's in a league of his own. Um, in, f in fact, uh, I had some interactions with um, um, what's his name? Uh, Rouse. The Ra you ever hear of the Rouse Company in Columbia, Maryland? Only well, he, he slightly. Is, he is considered the guru of urban development. Mm -hmm. Developed Faneuil Hall, mm -hmm. Harbor Place in Baltimore, mm -hmm. whatever. Cummings is right up like, there, like like James James Rouse. Um, so you started off the TTFs, the tax uh, uh, TIF. Uh, uh, T TIF in, uh, incentive financing um, and by 96 there was no debt by 96 we were able to fully overcome the deficit that I had it, uh, we had inherited yes three and years it took us and although you had your Battles with Lapini, the superintendent of schools. Home Massive Elementary Schools were built. The high school was built. And plans were started for the middle school. Um, you're the one that started the development of the shopping center up in Brimble Avenue. I mean, you did so much, it's... But of course, you'll always have your detractors because they want to be in control. They're control freaks. <laughs> they had to get something in you, and they really couldn't. A um, couple things that didn't happen. The roads were not in very good shape. You weren't able to do anything with McDonald's. Uh, Beverly Golf and Tennis was a, a problem. Took care of flooding, the schools, the shoe, 128. Okay. okay, is there anything you want to say in conclusion? Well, I think, too, we, we were... I thought we covered an awful lot of it. I think we made, for example, the Public Works Department, Public Services, yes. much more cost-effective than it had been. We got a lot more bang for yeah, our buck. Yeah, you had a lot of dead weight, and it took it took a while to to, to get yeah. ri get get rid of that. 
and, right. and, and, and didn't have the requisite and way, skills. And new way of doing business. Definitely. No, in that uh, no, no, no nonsense. Um, you ran Beverly like a business that you were so used to. Well, certainly out in that direction, yes. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for coming by and giving us an introduction to your book. And I think you did one hell of a job as, as, okay. as mayor. Now, nine terms. There's only been about five people in the state that have gone there, been able to, to last that long. Yeah. So you must have been doing something right. Beverly needed you. You came along at the right time. Well, I'm pleased to have had the opportunity. And if people would like to read the book, we're having a signing on the 7th of September. 7th at... At, at Chianti on... And then Cabot it's Street. available the next day for sale at the Beverly Historical Society. And, and, it, and it'll be for sale that night. And we're not trying to make any money on this. If we make any money, we're going to split it three ways between right. Harbor Light, Rotary, Rotary, and Historic Beverly. Good. All right. You can get it in a paperback or in a hard, hard copy. Right. All right. We got to end this or they'll kick me out. <laughs> Thanks me again. Too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another edition of Senior Moments. Hope you enjoyed it and be sure to buy Bill's book. It's a winner. Ooh, ooh, the New Year's Eve we did the town the day we tore the goalposts down we will have these moments too